Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Buckeyes, your daily podcast on the Ohio State Buckeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, guys? Welcome to this uh, special crossover episode we have for you today. I'm Jacob Rude, host of Locked On Hoosiers, joined by Jay Stevens, host of Locked On Buckeyes. How you doing, man? I'm doing very, very well. Excited for this weekend's game. Yeah, it it'll hopefully be a fun one. We'll uh, we'll get into that. Thank you, guys, as always, for making Locked On your first listen every day. Uh, I know as IU fans, when we uh, came into the season we had circled this as kind of the premier game of the of the season it turned out we were going to have a game like that about every other week but uh but how i know we, we've heard a lot about penn state we've heard a lot about iowa and the big 10 how is uh, how's the ohio state season been going uh, pretty good. Uh, it's been going pretty good. Uh, before the season, I was I had this game circled, Indiana-Ohio State, as a game that could possibly be at night, depending on if Indiana played up to expectations, preseason expectations. It could have been a game where game day comes to town. That's asking for a lot. But Ohio State season is good. I'm looking forward to this weekend's game coming off of a bye week. And it is under the lights in Bloomington, Indiana. And I know, I'm sure Ohio State will bring their best game this weekend. Yeah, I we actually uh, did a part of a podcast in the preseason looking at if there was any games that could be uh, college game day games for IU this season, and Ohio State was one of my thought that could be college game day wants nothing to do with us right now. <laughs> uh, the Hoosiers, we came in with the, the highest preseason ranking we'd had since uh, the 60s and have absolutely fallen flat on our face, but it's kind of been a double-edged sword where we've looked really bad, but uh, Ohio State will be the fifth top 10 team we'll play this season in seven games. Um, so it's kind of one of those, are we bad because we're bad or are we bad because we keep playing uh, top 10 teams and it hasn't really allowed IU to, to kind of iron out any of the issues they've had uh, with the offense, with pretty much everything going on with injuries. Uh, I know Ohio State had the Oregon game earlier this season, but it seems like uh, that was just kind of a, a little speed bump. Have you guys kind of hit the ground running since then? So the game after that one, after the Oregon loss, was the game against Tulsa <laughs> where Ohio State did not look up to par. You look at the final score, 41-20, to 20, the final score, you're thinking, wow, okay, Ohio State handled a Tulsa team that has struggled at times but can get – but can show promise throughout certain portions of the game. Well, late in that game, it was a seven-point game, and so you're thinking the Oregon game was just one hiccup. Well, the first three games of the season were the kind of games where Ohio State needed to get get smacked in the face, literally, figuratively, all those things, to figure out what's wrong with the team, what needs to be fixed quickly. Then the last three games after that, the most recent three games, 50 points put up against Akron, another 50 points plus against Rutgers, and then the most recent game, 66 points against Maryland. Seemed like it's really the tale of the first three games and the second three games. The first three were not the, really played that well um, in totality of those games. The second three games, most recent, Ohio State started to hit their stride and tried to, started to put things together. There has been no uh, – we've been – IU's been smacked in the face a lot. There hasn't been any kind of response from that. Uh, so far this season, they were smacked in the face right from the get-go against Iowa, uh, threw a couple pick sixes that game. At the time, it felt like a really bad loss, not quite as bad uh, in hindsight. Um, they came back against Idaho, but it was it was a really weird game. The scoreline says 56-14. to 14. They had three special defense or special teams touchdowns in that game. Uh, the offense you would hope that had been a time for them to get some things right, and they didn't. But they still, uh, Cincinnati, they took to the wire. They were dominating that game in the first half until a targeting penalty uh, took out Micah McFadden, uh, the star of our defense, uh -huh. and that changed the tone of the game. And they 
Cincinnati went on and controlled the rest of that game, the second half, really. Um, they came back Western Kentucky. They, they squeaked out a win. That's a not a fun Western Kentucky team to play. Uh, they are an air raid offense and threw for 400 yards that night. Uh, that was that was a stressful game to watch, but then they've come back their last two weeks. We were actually on ABC uh, against Penn State and laid an absolute egg. That's why I'm stunned that they put us back on ABC this week. But uh, the get shut out in Happy Valley that was a bit of a revenge game for for last season for the what the Hoosiers did, and then last week against Michigan State was probably the most frustrating game of the season because. They were right there. Uh, the defense played phenomenally, held Kenneth Walker to under 100 yards, held both the Michigan State's receivers to under 100 yards combined. Uh, Jay didn't read and Jalen Naylor, but the offense uh, couldn't get it done. They end up falling in that one. So it's kind of a season where in a different year where we're not playing top 10 opponents left and right, we – we might be uh, at 500, maybe a little bit better, but with the Big Ten East, which I, <laughs> as a Hoosier who is never good <laughs> in football, it is not fun to be a part of the Big Ten East. Uh, we we just get top 10 team after top 10 team. So we're in a stretch now. As, as I said, this is Penn State, Michigan State, Ohio State, and then we get Maryland, who hopefully we'll be able to beat, but then we get Michigan right after that. And now Purdue's ranked at the end of the season as well. So uh, there, there just hasn't been any any chance for us to catch our breath. And uh, I've said it a couple times, if this is the kind of karma for what last season was for us, I'll take it because last season was so much fun. But uh, it, it has been a rough going for the Hoosiers this season. Uh, we'll jump in here and... Uh, I'll, I'll ask you a little bit more about this Ohio State team, what the Hoosiers can expect here in just one moment. So, as I said, kind of coming into the year, and really every year, Ohio State's always kind of one of those games Hoosier fans circle. You're, you're the last monkey we can't get off our back. We got a lot of monkeys off our back last season, beating teams, Michigan's, Wisconsin's. Ohio State's still the one that uh, we haven't been able to to beat or to uh, to get over that hurdle. But uh, the, we'll start on offense there. I know there was some debate coming into the season with quarterback play, but it, it sure seems like C.J. Stroud has kind of uh, found his groove there. He definitely has. I do believe he had a shoulder injury, or I know he had a shoulder injury early in the season. And just him get, getting his feet wet and figuring out college football for the very first time, getting play after play after play, not a spot play here or a spot play there like he got last year. And we're seeing C.J. Stroud, when he missed that game against Akron for health reasons to get his shoulder right, some people said he should be, he should get benched. I don't think that was a whole f the full reason why. Now, maybe Ryan Day did want to get a couple other quarterbacks some looks on the field. That's great. But I do believe C.J. Stroud needed his shoulder to get healthy. But I think in that time off, that week off that he had, he looked at the film and he realized what he was doing wrong, what he was doing right. Maybe some things he could tweak the, the minor details that make a big difference. I, he, finding some of those things there – he could tweak and fine-tune his game, which is why I believe Ohio State has looked the way they have against Akron, against Rutgers, against Maryland, because C.J. Stroud came out and realized, hey, I can make this throw. I can make that throw. I can see this before it happens. I can see that before it happens. I can anticipate throws that lead to touchdowns on that same play. So I do believe C.J. Stroud, he is the guy. He has shown he's a guy. I do believe the early season struggles, those are just growing pains that any quarterback might go through. Yeah, that certainly seemed like it was the case uh, with the growing pains, and now absolutely is looks on fire. Um, but it's also, I don't want to say easier, but you also have, have two of the top wide receivers in the country, uh, Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, just that passing attack in general. I, I assume those two are still terrorizing secondaries. Yeah, it also helps when you have a guy in Jackson Smith and Jigba right there in the slot that's taking up some attention there as well. So no matter if they, if they want to double one of the other receivers, 
you can't double one or the other, but you're going to leave Jackson Smith and Jigba with the with the defender on him. That probably can't guard him. He is really good. His footwork is amazing. And his ability, what Brian Hartland, Hartland teaches so well, to get over on the top of the defender. All three of these guys do that very well. They're great off the line. They're great in the routes, in the middle. They're great getting over top of the receiver, high pointing the ball. I mean, they have so many details about their game that are not normal for three receivers on the same team to have such a – to be such a threat once the ball is in their hand. But Olave and Wilson, potential first-round draft picks, no later than second round for either one of them, but they both might go in the first round. They're, they are hitting their stride, and they're part of the reason that Stroud has looked so good over the past three games. Maybe one of the, the surprises for you offensively has been Travion Henderson. The, uh, I believe he's a true freshman coming mm -hmm. in and uh, – kind of taking control of that backfield. How impressive has he been this year? I think he's been so impressive and he's been so good. People have not really recognized, or no, they've recognized it, haven't given him the acknowledgement that I believe they should. I mean, think about it. You mentioned Kenneth Walker the third. They both have nine touchdowns, but I believe that Travion Henderson, nine rushing touchdowns that is, I believe Travion Henderson has 40, at least 40 less carries than Kenneth Walker the third. He's so explosive. He gets the ball, and it helps when you have a big, massive offensive line that opens holes for him. But once he sees a hole, gets through the hole, gets to the second level, it's very hard for people to get him down because he doesn't go down on first contact, and he's so fast, so elusive, great in the open field. A lot of times, he just goes untouched in some of these runs. That's just how good he is. Once the ball's in his hands, Hoosier fans, I was going to say, watch out. Yeah, absolutely. We – uh Obviously saw Kenneth Walker last week, dodged that bullet. I don't know. I, I was worried at times because I, I heard a lot of the same things about him, and it's just terrifying to see those types of guys get the ball, and it only takes a, a small slip up, and they're gone. Um, defensively, I know there's a lot of focus on the the Ohio State offense with all that talent you guys have, but defensive side of the ball, um, I guess how, how are things going there? Who are some – some key players that have uh, stuck out for you guys. I'm going to start right here with a, a true freshman that we started with. We ended off talking about a true freshman and Travion Henderson. Denzel Burke, true freshman starting corner, was not supposed to start at the beginning of the season, but due to injuries, he got thrust into the starting lineup against Minnesota, and he has not let that job go to anybody else but himself. He is the best corner on the team so far this season. Um, Ohio State is looking to get a guy in Cam Brown back who had been hurt for a little bit. Um, but I think Denzel Burke that's with the secondary that had so many questions, had so many holes to fill. Denzel Burke has been a very, 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 very solid piece. Another true freshman, Tyleek Williams, doesn't start. Might down the road, might this week. He's been very, very good. 315 pounds. He doesn't move like he's 315 pounds. I'm highlighting the freshmen. I could go to the linebackers and other players on the defensive line. But those, those freshmen are really pushing the older guys to be a lot better than they are. There's a couple linebackers, still Chambers, used to be a running back, Taraja Mitchell, Cody Simon. They've really played very good at the linebacker position that needed guys to step up in a big way early in the season. I know a big thing with the Hoosiers right now all season long has been poor offensive line play. Uh, is there anybody on that kind of defensive line that, that could potentially uh, create havoc for the Hoosiers on Saturday? Well, I mentioned one guy in Tyleek Williams, true freshman defensive tackle, 315-pounder. Um, Haskell Garrett, uh, All-American last season, defensive tackle. <coughs> he should be back this this week. Um, so that's another guy that could wreak some havoc up the middle. You get a lot of pass pressure, uh, pass rush up the middle in the interior of the def defensive line. Hoping, I've been hoping all year, Jacob, I'm hoping that Zach Harrison starts to get some of that pass rush um pressure during the games we, that we expect, looking to get Tyreek Smith back from what we believe was a concussion. So those two guys, Harrison and Smith, those are the seasoned guys. You also have Sawyer and Tua Malowal, two more true freshmen that have been very, very good in the rotation for Ohio State. The pressure for in the past rush hasn't been there consistent. That's one thing I've been calling for all season long. I wonder against a bad offensive line that the Hoosiers have, if this is the week that the D line for Ohio State starts to get pressure, not just from the middle, but from the outside defensive end positions. Yeah, this is uh, 
Unfortunately, a lot of times this season, the Hoosiers have been a get-right game for defensive lines and, and for pass rushes because uh, the the offensive line has struggled all season long. That w- continues to be the case. It was the case last week uh, against Michigan State, and I don't see any sign or any reason that that might change. Uh, just kind of last thing, talking about Ohio State, obviously the big matchup against Penn State is next week. Any chance or any fear that this could be some type of trap game for you guys? Um, so I'm going to say something that Buckeye fans might not like. It may make you laugh. If Urban Meyer were the coach, I'd be a little bit nervous. I'm not so <laughs> nervous with Ryan Day as the coach. I believe Ryan Day, even in the Oregon game, I think the Oregon game was more player personnel and players not doing their job. I don't think Ryan Day didn't have a team ready to prepare for the game. I firmly think it was the inexperienced and it was kind of the, uh, the perfect storm at that time that Oregon brought to Columbus on that Saturday afternoon. So, yes, in theory, it could be a trap game. Urban, is no Meyer. Urban Meyer is no longer the coach. It's Ryan Day. The preparation, their mindsets are different. So I'm not so ner- as nervous as I would be if this game was played a few years ago when the former coach was calling the shots in Columbus, Ohio. Darn. I was hoping that there would be hope for a uh, <laughs> for a trap game there because uh, IU is going to need all the help it is going to get. Uh, we'll take w- another quick break here, and then when we come back, we will talk talk about the Hoosiers and uh, kind of what's went wrong on that side of the uh, field this season. Jacob. The game is a couple days away from now. We have talked about just some general things about the, each team, talked about the Ohio State Buckeyes, but now the eyes are turned to you and the Hoosiers as they have a big game this weekend. It's under the lights in Memor- at Memorial Stadium, um, looking to average over 50,000 people in attendance in at in Bloomington for the season so far. I'm assuming this game is going to be a sellout. I believe the average attendance mm-hmm. right now I saw – is a shade under 50,000, be above 50,000 with this weekend's game. A question I have, I'm sure Buckeye fans have as well, who's starting at quarterback for this team? Uh, officially, Michael Penix is listed still as week to week, but there's been some moves that they've made that you can kind of read between the lines to see that uh, it, I, it's not – Penix probably isn't going to come back this season. Tom Allen's one that – very much keeps kind of those injuries very, very tight to the vest, as I'm sure basically all co- coaches do. Uh, he went down in that Penn State game with a AC joint separation in his throwing shoulder. And um, at the time, he was listed week to week. We have our third string quarterback, who Donovan McCauley, who you might be familiar with. Mm-hmm. Um, he was going to be redshirted this year, and they announced this week that there's no more redshirt. He played a couple snaps against Michigan State. They said the plan is for him to play a little bit more. So things like that where you read between the lines where uh, I don't think Penix is coming back anytime soon, certainly. So it's going to be Jack Tuttle. Uh, Buckeye fans may be able to breathe a, a sigh of relief that there's no Michael Penix in the in this game. But uh, the Michael Penix that had been playing this season was – just kind of physically broken and uh, never really looked himself anyway. So there isn't going to be uh, uh, almost 500 yards thrown on uh, on Ohio State this weekend. The Indiana Hoosier offense is averaging 3.4 yards a carry. I do believe earlier in the season they had a couple guys enter the transfer portal, one of them being former Ohio State commit Samson James, who committed and decommitted and then committed to Indiana during his senior year of high school at Avon, at Avon High School, I believe. Stephen Carr, the USC transfer, is now the guy getting all the touches, all the carries. What's going on to that position? Because I'm used to Indiana having a better rushing attack than they've had this year. Well, I, I would say it's not Stephen Carr's fault. Uh, Stephen Carr has been terrific. Uh, he's been kind of exactly what we needed to replace Stevie Scott from last season. The offensive line, as I've kind of mentioned, has been uh, really, really bad for a lot of this, a mm-hmm. uh, lot of this season, both in uh, run blocking and in pass blocking. Um, Coming into the season, as you mentioned, we had a really deep running back room, and it was kind of a wide-open competition during fall camp who would uh, be the starting running back. Stephen Carr won out. Uh, Immediately, Samson James, after that, entered the transfer portal, is uh, committed to Purdue now. Um, And then 
couple weeks ago during the bye week, Tim Baldwin Jr., who was our backup, who was another kind of highly rated prospect for us, entered the transfer portal as well. So we're down to Stephen Carr and a handful of preferred walk-ons and things like that. Um, but Carr has fully kind of carried the load. Uh, it was pretty clear that he was going to be the guy anyway. Um, but the offensive line has struggled so much this season, especially in Big Ten games, uh, that it it really hasn't mattered who's behind um, behind the quarterback in that backfield. Uh, there'll be some brief moments where uh, Carr may be able to break some tackles and, and get a big run here or there. Uh, but in Big Ten play, he hasn't had more than 57 yards in a game this season. So it, a lot of it comes down, and a lot of the offensive struggle overall comes down to a, an offensive line that um, hasn't really been able to get going this season. Any chance my guy Charlie Spiegel, former Indiana Mr. Football, get some carries this weekend? I wouldn't say he'd get any carries. He was a scout team player of the week okay. last week, okay. if, that, okay. if that makes you makes you any happier. But I think he's only had one carry this year. I think it might have been that Idaho game. But uh, he is he's moved up the depth chart a lot. So seems like anything is possible uh, this uh, this season with that running back room. But yeah, there there's a lot of walk ons. There, there's a it's a kind of a running back by committee approach. We take a lot of times. We've kind of been forced into giving Carr a whole lot of carries, and as I said, he's lived up to the to the uh, talent and the hype that he kind of came in with. One of the most interesting things that I'm looking at right now on my screen is that between Ty Freifogel and Peyton Hendershot, <laughs> you can even add Miles Marshall into that. The top three reception, um, top well, top two in receptions, and then Miles Marshall's number four, but he um, is big there in the passing game. There's only two touchdowns between Freifogel, Hendershot, and Marshall combined, two passing touchdowns. That's really confusing to me and very odd because people remember the game last year and how Penix was throwing the ball to anybody, and it was a comeback in the second half of the game. What's the story What's the story behind that? Yeah, so the receiving core has been really, really frustrating this season. Um, Freifogel came back, he kind of flirted with the NFL draft, came back, had a lot of the preseason recognition that Olave and Wilson did uh, within the Big Ten and even some nationally. He has struggled mightily, and it, it, it's been a lot of just drop balls, and it's mm. been a concern, uh, something we you, we haven't really figured out because um, he's kind of getting himself into position and getting open, and then it's a lot of easy passes he's dropping. Um so I don't know if at any point there would be a kind of a positive regression to the mean and he starts to make some of those plays. Uh, but that's kind of been the tale with him. His one touchdown came in that Idaho game. Um, and the Hoosiers overall just have struggled in the red zone, which is kind of another reason why those numbers are so low. Um, Hendershot, his uh, touchdown, I believe, came in the Penn State game. Hendershot has been uh, a really big weapon for us. Um, especially when Penix was healthy. Um, he'd been really useful as a tight end for us, a, a pass-catching tight end. Um, he didn't play quite as well last week, but the offense overall struggled. Uh, DJ Matthews had been our best wide receiver through the first three games and then tore his ACL, um, I believe, in that Western Kentucky game. But Miles Marshall was another name that played last season, and he's his has been less of, of kind of the dropping passes, and he, he just hasn't really been a factor in the pass game at all. So um, it's been a really disappointing output from the second or this uh, wide receiving core uh, for a team that, that had a lot of talent coming back, and uh, especially from Freifogel. I'm going to combine these. Well, it's one question, just two different players. How will Micah McFadden and Taiwan Mullen put their fingerprints on Saturday's game? Taiwan Mullen is up in the air. He uh, he didn't play the Penn State game. He didn't play last week against Michigan State. Had a boot on his foot. Again, Tom Allen, kind of close to the vest, uh, said he hoped that he would be back on Saturday. Um, even without him, though, the Hoosiers have played tremendously well in both those games defensively. I would say this is the best defense Tom Allen's had, and that's a, a pretty lofty goal because last year's defense was really good. Micah McFadden, though, I I feel he's the best linebacker in the country. Uh, he is everywhere. Anytime there's a big play uh, on the defensive end, it's almost always as a result of him. 
Um, he was huge in, in containing um, Kenneth Walker last week. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a couple plays just bursting through the line, um, making big stops in the backfield. Uh, he leads the team uh, in tackles for loss. Uh, he also leads the team in sacks, which is the other thing he's tremendous at is just as a blitzing linebacker getting to the quarterback. Um, he He's everywhere. He's he's incredible. Um, he, you will see him throughout the game making plays all over the field, on the edges, up the middle, um, pass breakups occasionally, things like that. So uh, I, he, he's going to have an impact. It's just uh, whether this defense can do enough. Because at this point, you, we almost need our defense to score points to be able to really compete in these games. One more for you. Who is another player on this Indiana defense that Buckeye fans should know about? Yeah, there's been a lot of guys that have really stepped up. I would say potentially one other name uh, is Ryder Anderson on the mm -hmm. defensive line. He was mm -hmm. a transfer uh, from Ole Miss. He played the Hoosiers in that bowl game last season and then almost immediately transferred to IU um, and came in this season. At the beginning of the year, he was – Really, really good. He actually was named the MVP of fall camp for the defense mm. uh, to give you a sense of, of how good he is with some of those All-Americans. Um, he's second on the team in sacks, had a sack last week against Michigan State, third on the team in tackles. Uh, last year, that Hoosiers defensive line uh, wasn't really able to create a whole lot of pressure, which really made how good they were all the more impressive because they just didn't get a lot from the defensive line. He's come in and provided that for Indiana, which I think is really kind of uh, taking the defense to that next level. Him and, and Weston Kramer uh, in the middle of that defense or defensive line, uh, both transfers, both have come in and, and provided kind of that spark for the Hoosiers. So if I had to pick one other person, I'd say Ryder Anderson is going to be another guy that uh, is going to be real pivotal, pivotal in, in stopping that run game and hopefully pressuring C.J. Stroud some. Jacob, I don't know about you, man, but I'm excited for this weekend's game. It's been fun talking both Hoosiers and Buckeyes. We're looking forward to what we're going to see this weekend in Bloomington, Indiana, under the lights.